I feel like it's finally time to put the E36 back together. It's been sitting up on the lift for something like six months with no rear end in it. It started out as a simple subframe repair job, but I lost motivation because I realized once I put it back together, I'd have to drive around in an E36 that has no interior in it, and that doesn't really appeal to me. I'm trying to fall back in love with this car. But with interior parts on the way, I'm feeling some motivation, and when motivation strikes, I know I should follow suit, and I've got a few parts and pieces on the way to really finish up the undercarriage of this car. So we're gonna see how far we get on it. I'm filming this intro before I've done any work, so I have no idea how this is gonna go. And the problem at hand is I have no recollection of how the rear end of this car goes back together. I had help taking it apart. My buddy Khalil knows these things like the back of his hand. We didn't label anything, and so it's a bit of a puzzle to put it all back to one piece, but I'm feeling excited about it, so we're gonna see how far we get. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't yet, because if you don't, I'll probably have to go get a job, and if I get a job, it'll be putting other people's E36s back together, and I think as you're gonna see in this episode, that wouldn't work very well for me, and it definitely won't work out for whoever owns the E36 I've gotta work on. So, hit that button, and let's see how far we get. So it turns out it's been almost six months to the day since we last had an episode based on the E36, and the last we saw of it, we were focusing on repairing the torn subframe mounts in the floor. I included a tidbit in a previous episode about the fact that the floor has been welded up and repaired, but otherwise it's remained untouched ever since. I've showcased the slew of parts that I've been stockpiling for this car since we're doing a rebuild of the entire underside. But because there's only so much space in the shop, I took all of these parts and stored them on top of one of the offices. So I've got to one by one bring them all back down, including the extraordinarily heavy differential. With everything down, it's time to get that subframe assembled. And we've got new poly bushings to press into place. This subframe has been completely re-powder coated and it's had a lot of reinforcements welded into place, so it's arguably better than it came from the factory. A bit of silicone lubricant goes a long way for installing these bushings, but here you can see me using factory BMW tool part number 42069 to get it squeezed into place. While the clamp worked okay, it didn't take long for me to realize there was a much better tool for the job this time being BMW Specialty Tool part number 69420. A rubber mallet just tapped these things right into place and wasted no time at all. Next on the list is to install spherical bearings on our upper rear control arms. These bearings will be going on the inside of these control arms, and installation is probably the simplest part of this entire subframe rebuild. They're held in with a simple circlip, and they slip right into place. I can only wish that the rest of the job had been this easy. Now the other thing that we need to install on these upper rear control arms are these, and this is called a weight jack. And I've showed these in a previous episode, but I kind of wanted to showcase them because I think it's going to leave some of you guys scratching your heads about what I'm doing. Now normally there's a spring mount that goes right here, and this is where the spring on an E36 sits. It's got a divorced spring and shock in the rear. We're going to need to cut this down a little bit in order to install this, but essentially the control arm is going to sandwich between this piece and this piece here. These will close together and mount this. This is the spring mount, and what's cool is there's actually a ball joint inside of this. I can't articulate it by hand, but you can imagine this thing can swivel around and do this number. And the reason that's cool is for a couple of reasons, the biggest one being that the control arm travels on an arc, and that means the spring has to kind of bend non-linearly uh, as it goes through the travel, and this actually allows the spring to articulate, or I guess rather not articulate, uh, and instead travel in a straight line. Uh, it gives you a much more linear spring rate and is apparently better for travel. That's what everybody says. The other cool thing is that you're able to use this hex on the bottom of it to adjust the height or the balance of the car. So without having to jack it up, you can spin this and corner balance the car easier or change your ride height. So all in all, it's a pretty cool little part. Uh, we're going to get this cut down and installed, and then this thing should be good to go into the rear subframe. 
To clearance the control arm, I'm once again using a flap wheel on the end of the die grinder, and it turns out this end bit was definitely worth snagging last time I was at the hardware store. I'm always trying out new tools, and this one has moved to the top of the list of things that are a must have. With the original spring seat locator buzzed down, these aluminum parts sandwich exactly as intended and leave just enough room for yet another circlip to hold them together. This circlip will keep the unit as a whole from moving as you adjust the spring from underneath the car. Next is this weird looking thing, the rear trailing arm. And we've got rear trailing arm bushings as well as outer control arm bushings to press into it. Both are notoriously difficult and a huge pain, but I want to tackle the hardest one first, which is supposed to be the primary bushing. I tried a few different methods in order to install this, and I thought I'd have some luck by using a big clamp. I wasn't entirely sure how tight the fitment would be, and honestly, the clamp did work to some degree, and you could do this with enough effort. But I did find that it fought, and it fought, and fought some more, and we finally gave up and decided to use the press for this job. If you've got an E36 of your own and want to do this yourself, you will need a very serious clamp to pull it off, because even this big one wanted to bend. Of course, the press itself made easy work of this and made me realize this is where I should have started with the job. Always try to use the right tool. The end result leaves us with these awesome spherical bearings in place of the original rubber units, and while they might be a bit harsher, they're going to be great for driving dynamics. At this point, we're waiting on parts, so it's time to clean up some of the metal underneath the car and get this stuff painted. We need to let it dry overnight before we actually install our parts. For a coating, I'm using Steel It because I can apply it to bare metal and it's a seriously rust resistant paint. The other added benefit is it's really close to the color of my car, so it works in a way at least. I let the paint cure up for about 12 hours, and when I returned the next morning, it was time to get that subframe installed. One of the studs had a slight bend to it, but it was easy to account for with that specialty tool I mentioned earlier. It was admittedly reassuring when everything lined up the way that it was supposed to, knowing that I did get those mounts welded into place correctly. Being able to hammer on that stud also showed that it's nice and stout and strong, and I feel really good about this moving forward. So we've just had our first UPS delivery for the day, and it's from uh, our friends over at Bimmer World. Austin sent over uh, overnight some bushings that I needed to get this thing put together. These are gonna go uh, in these guys right here, and I borrowed the specialty tool to do it, uh, this time actually having the correct tool. This guy installs those things. Khalil let me borrow this. So we can put these spherical bearings, I guess I should say, uh, in the trailing arms and get the trailing arms in now that we've got the subframe in and the lower control arm So good progress there. I'm excited to press these in and uh, Keep going and of course in the background. I've got the TV on it's been pretty nice to have right now Super fast Matt is explaining the rule of pi which I've never heard of before and found it to be pretty Humorously interesting. He says if you anticipate it to take you let's say a month to do something on your race car it will actually take you 3.14 times that. And if you plan on it taking $1,000 to finish something, it's gonna, of course, take 3.14 times that. And damn if that's not true. So hopefully it won't take 3.14 times as long as I think to put the rest of this car back together. Khalil showed up on his lunch break and we put that real specialty tool to work installing the spherical bearings for the outer upper control arms. And while this specialty tool is meant for this exact job, I have to say using it is quite a chore. Realistically, it's just a bolt and a pair of cups that are properly sized for this job, one to press on the bearing and one to be seated against the trailing arm itself so that it can do the job of pulling. These bearings are a really tight fit inside of the trailing arm, so it requires a lot of force in order to get them to fully seat. So then it should probably come as no surprise that this tool worked for the first bearing and it worked partway through the second, but as we got to this point, 
we realized the tool was starting to fail. Some of the threads were stripping off, and we quickly realized this tool was not going to finish this bearing, let alone the other two for the other trailing arm. I fought with it a bit by myself after Khalil's lunch break came to an end, but I quickly threw in the towel. You can see just how much work was having to go into this, and it was clearly not working. I am losing it over here. The other camera died, which is probably a good thing because I was screaming at the control arm, trailing arm, because the bolt for this assembly tool, uh, the threads stripped out on it. I chased them with a die, cleaned it up, but there's a thread that broke off completely and the nut won't go past it, or it will, but it just kind of spins. It doesn't work. So I had to toss this out. I found the all thread that I used to put the crank pulley on the Coyote, and it's good all thread. Used it and finished installing the second bushing. Went to the new control arm, tried to use it. The threads on this got gunked up, didn't want to work. I actually had to cut it off in order to get it off. Even my huge impact wouldn't get it done. Uh, so now I have no tool to put it together. I tried going across the street to Brett's to see if I could use his big arbor press and maybe try to finagle something together, but he's not there. And my press is just a huge piece of junk. It's like a Harbor Freight Special. It's also a bit old at this point, and it does this number. If you load this up, it really tries to push off axis and it makes pressing anything in pretty dang difficult. Not to mention that this beam is totally bent, so you can't really get anything level here. And the whole thing is just, honestly, it's a pile of junk. I should throw it out and buy a new one. So, yeah, I don't know what to do. I'm scratching my head. I gotta figure out some sort of solution here. Hopefully I'll hear from Brett before too long, because otherwise I'm at a stopping point and that would be a bummer, because I really would like to get this back on the ground. That was kind of my goal for an episode. Uh, but yeah, BMW control arm bushings not going together. Who could have guessed? No surprise there. BMW suck, don't buy one. Speaking of right tool for the job, Brett eventually texted me back and let me know he had just stepped out for lunch and I was free to head over and we'd solve this bearing problem. We used his enormous compound arbor press and it made instant work of these things. The same job that had taken me close to two hours to accomplish at my shop took maybe two minutes. Now, of course, I can't afford one of these because they fetch some seriously big money, but it is a reminder that I should try to approach things the correct way, and using a bolt to draw bearings in is unquestionably not the right way to do it, and I think any engineer or any machinist would probably tell me that. So thank you, Brett, as always, for saving my butt. We've got all four outer control arm bearings pressed into place. We can finally start getting more parts installed on the car, and up next on the list are these lower control arms for the rear. They'll allow me to adjust camber, and they've got spherical bearings already pressed into them, so they'll be a nice upgrade. The one thing to note though is, they have to go in before the differential. These bolts will not come out with a diff in place, so if you do this in the wrong order, the entire setup has to come back apart. Thankfully, Khalil learned that the hard way and passed that information along. Otherwise, I'd have made the same mistake. We want to get the trailing arms mounted up soon, which means mounting the trailing arm bearing carriers. Installing these is a pretty simple operation. They go in with a simple bolt. However, if you're looking for any tips, I prefer doing the whole process twice, starting by installing them backwards. I find that doing this and then taking them off and reinstalling them gives you a lot of good extra practice for that second installation. Once you realize you've installed them the wrong way around and flip them to the correct orientation, they'll bolt right into the E36. While I was working on that, another UPS order showed up, this time from FCP Euro, which includes a handful of parts that will need to actually finish this job up. So let's see what's inside these boxes. Our first FCP part is some new rear hubs, uh, which is probably kind of silly to replace. They're not totally necessary, 
But to get these out of the old bearings, we had to torch the hell out of them. Uh, these things are old, gross, and I don't know, they were heated red hot. I just felt like it was the responsible thing to just replace them. So we've got new hubs, and then we've got some new axles that'll go in at the very end. These will need to get pressed into those guys. And I can't forget to put the brake shields on before these, or I have to take them back out and destroy the bearing. Don't forget that. Don't forget that. Khalil cruised by after work, and we were excited to get this job finished up, so we pressed the first hub into place, only to realize we indeed forgot the brake shield. I wasn't kidding earlier when I said I wouldn't make a good E36 mechanic. I'm a better fabricator than I am a technician. So throw me a like if you're at least getting some laughs out of my own misfortune here. It's all in good fun. With the brake shields and the hubs installed, the trailing arms can go into the car, followed by the upper control arms. And that's most of the rear end setup. I tried to record this with the big camera as well, but its battery died as soon as we started, so this is the best you get for the entire rear end installation. Here the upper control arm goes in, and then the final bolts. There's still a long way to go back here, but it's taking shape and I'm getting excited. It's not going to be too long before this car is on the ground, and all of these new parts make me feel really excited to drive this car once again. While I wish I could replace some of the hardware while I'm at it, everything under here should be brand new, aside from those brake shields. The idea at hand is to have an S54 swapped E36 that is more or less brand new underneath, and I think we're well on our way. So that was a very full day, and unfortunately, very obviously, the car's not on the ground. I thought about kind of delaying the episode a little bit, maybe posting it partway through the day tomorrow and trying to stay late and finish this up, but I'm realizing that there's still coilovers that need to go on the back. We've got to put the fuel cell or fuel tank back in it. We've got to put the drive shaft, the exhaust, the differential, the axles, uh, and all sorts of other just like little tidbits and that's gonna take time. There's no shortcutting that. So instead of rushing it, I'm gonna stop there. I hope you guys are enjoying it. There will be one other episode to get this thing back on the ground, but that means it's actually pretty close and we're not really waiting on any parts to do anything. So I feel pretty good about it and I'm excited. This car is getting closer to being back on the ground. Other than that, that's where this episode ends. I've got a couple things to show you guys. Uh, Brandon Bergeron sent over a surprise care package with some new pointers. We haven't seen these guys in a while, but he sent some over. Uh, this one is carbon fiber, and then this one is aluminum. So very high tech, and I appreciate that, Brandon. Thank you. Uh, that'll be a fun addition. We'll have to make sure we use these more. And then last but not least, I have a little bit of a tool uh, thing to share. I made a purchase the other day. I'm a really big fan of Fireball Tool, and if you're not subscribed to his channel, you should be. He produces awesome content, is always up to just cool stuff, and makes really cool things. I have some of his tools, some of his squares and whatnot, and during a video of his earlier this week, he posted up a drill index, drill bit index, uh, that was like 130 bucks for all of the sizes from half inch all the way up to one inch instead of having to use step bits, which is what I do all the time. He said that he had found good use out of the kit. It wasn't amazing, but he said it was worth having around. And so I jumped right on it. It's pretty cool that he suggests tools that are not only his own, but others for guys like you and me. So I bought this. It's a pretty cool little kit. It's got every 64th inch size all the way up to one inch. Uh, and I'm glad to have this around. So I'll put a link to the Amazon. I'll put a link to the Amazon page for this stuff in the description if you want to snag one for yourself. It'll be good to have around. Comes with a cool case, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Anyways, that's all I've got for you guys today. Thank you as always for the support. We'll be back on Tuesday with some Model A content because on Saturday we're going to tear that engine apart again. I've got new timing components to go in. We're going to make some good progress maybe even some tuning if it sorts out the problem. So we'll see, see how it pans out. I'll catch you guys on Tuesday. I'll see you then.